Moses is the most important figure. With Moses, the covenant of God, the promise of a nation of its own, the promise that God gave to Abraham and was passed on from Isaac and Jacob, becomes tangible. And when we so go back to the land of Goshen, where we left yesterday, as you will remember, once Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, his father Jacob and all the flocks and herds and family were transported into Egypt. And there they settled right there on the banks of one of the tributaries of the Nile Delta in the land was that the Bible calls Goshen on the Eastern Delta. And so when we, when we come to this story again, the book of Exodus now, we have, uh, we have ended the book of Genesis, we're now going into the book of Exodus, tells us how the offspring of Jacob and Joseph lived in Goshen for 400 years, but then as we know, in the historical context, this is not what the Bible tells us, this is what the archaeological evidence tells us, the Hyksos, the Semitic chieftains of ancient Egypt who ruled in that era were ousted by the Egyptian aristocracy and the old Egyptian nobility moved back in lower Egypt making the Israelites who had been living there for so long second-class citizens and eventually they became enslaved and started to build cities for Pharaoh. Now Moses, the Bible tells us, was an Israelite who was raised as a prince at the court of Pharaoh and ultimately punished Pharaoh with ten plagues sent by God so that his people could go into, on the route to the promised land. And then the Israelites spent 40 years in the desert before invading Canaan, that's the word that the Bible uses for Palestine at the stage, the promised land from the Jordan. So that's, that's the story. Now what's the meaning? The meaning is that in the Hebrew scriptures, the Exodus is the quintessential redemption experience that validates the saving power of Yahweh. It is as if Yahweh created a rescue mission, if you will, to liberate the people of Israel from the clutches of Pharaoh and brought them safely in the promised land. And time and time again, when you read the books of the prophets, when you read the writings, even into the New Testament, time and again, prophets and Jesus will refer back to this redemptive action of God saving the people out of Egypt as proof, as physical proof, that God exists, that there is a covenant with the people of Israel, and that only by honoring that covenant will the people of Israel prosper. And that, of course, as we've said, is codified in the laws of Moses, this, the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus, which spells out the many different laws, the cultic laws, by which the people will ultimately prosper. So Exodus really marks the moment when an ancestral belief of Abraham matures into a national faith, that of Judaism. Well, you might say that's all very nice and well, but what is the evidence Yesterday we saw historical evidence for the context of Joseph. So is there any archaeological evidence that can point us in the direction of when, where, and how the Exodus took place? And I must disappoint you because archaeologists have as yet failed to uncover any evidence of a mass migration to Canaan. Now I say mass migration in the sense of 600,000 people, this is the, the number that the Bible uses, 600,000 people moving en masse from Egypt to Canaan. No, we have not seen any evidence of that. Uh, nor have we seen any reference in the records, and there are ample records of the time, in the Egyptian records uh, from the New Kingdom describing this big exodus. Well, I myself don't find that so surprising because folks like Ramses II did not make a habit of recording their defeats. And of course the Exodus, as the Bible describes it, was a defeat. They lost and Pharaoh and all his charioteers perished. What we do see in that same period 
is a lot of movement going the other way of Canaan being invaded by Egyptian military, particularly under Tutmosis III, who is sometimes called the Napoleon of Egypt. And yet, just as in the case of Joseph, there are a number of clues that can help us make some sense of the historical context of the Exodus story. And that's what we're going to look at right now. And I think, truly, from a historical, as a historian, I think the story really begins with this man. Now, you may not necessarily recognize him, sort of an odd picture, but his, uh, his name is Amenhotep IV. And in 1350 BC, today we say before the Common Era, sort of a politically correct way of saying BC, Amenhotep IV shocked Egypt because he did away with all the national gods and the priesthood, which had a tremendous power over the land, and ordered that from this point forward, only one god should be worshipped, and this one god was the sun god, Aten. In fact, he himself said that from now on, he would be known by the name Akhenaten. And Akhenaten even created a whole new city near El Amarna. And from that point on, he was so obsessed with creating this new national monotheism, this worship of the sun god Aten, that Akhenaten ignored and neglected the foreign possessions such as Canaan, such as Palestine, leaving the country open to invasion. So you can imagine what happened when finally the successors came, did away with this silly worship of, sun, of the sun god, and restored the national gods, because the first thing they said is, we must we must reinforce ourselves, we must rebuild the military power that Egypt was that had been neglected for so long, for almost 30 years, by Akhenaten. And this is the reason, friends, while Sedai I launched a massive military program to restore Egypt's might, to restore Egypt's empire, including buffer states as Canaan and Syria, and to do so, he needed new military garrisons built along the vulnerable eastern border. Now, this is my interpretation, but I think it's very compelling because what you see is when you look at the border of Egypt, and of course it ran quite along the geographical border of the Nile Delta, and it's, it's quite obvious that the best place to put those cities would be on the very edge of the fertile area close to the old Aver city of Avaris, which was the capital of the Hyksos. The problem was, who was going to build these cities? Who was going to build these new military garrisons? Because obviously, uh, most of Egypt's manpower was under the colors, was serving in the vastly expanded armies by which these kings went back into Canaan to enforce their control, to enforce tribute, to control the agriculture, so who was going to build these cities? Well, I think it's at that point that their eye fell on these uh, semi Semitic shepherds and farmers who had been working in Goshen for quite some time, whose legal status was quite uncertain. The Bible tells us there rose a pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And so that puts the whole story of the Bible claiming that at one point the farmers and shepherds who were previously uh, farmers from Canaan into slavery, that that makes it very plausible because somebody had to build these cities and Pharaoh, in this case, Sedai the first said, come, let us set taskmasters over them. And here you have an Egyptian relief of just exactly such a taskmaster. This is a relief found in Saqqara, of an Egyptian supervisor beating up a poor slave who's obviously not been working hard enough. And there is a, uh, a very interesting uh, quote from a grand vizier. We saw yesterday that Joseph was a grand vizier. Well, this is a historical grand vizier, Rekmire. And Rekmire was in charge of some of the construction that was going on in those days. And in his tomb, he says, I have fed these Habiru tribes bread, beer, and every good thing. But the rod is in my hand, 
So be not idle. And that, I think, is a beautiful illustration of exactly what the Bible is telling us. And this is what I find so exciting, when you see a correlation between what the Bible is telling us and what the archaeological record is telling us. And when these two things converge and find harmony, it really brings us face to face with the issues that the Bible was grappling with. So let's assume that these cities were being built. Well, Sedai I was succeeded by Ramses II, perhaps the greatest pharaoh of the New Kingdom. And Ramses II was a very modest man because whenever he found a temple built by somebody else, he would put his own name on it. And that's why when you go to Egypt, and for those of you who have done it, you probably have found when you travel down the Nile, you see these beautiful large temples in Karnak and so forth, inevitably you will see the cartouche of Ramses II plastered all over it. Doesn't mean that Ramses II built it, he just felt it was important that his, his name be placed upon it. And so in this case, the city, the garrison city, the military city that Sedai I built was renamed by Ramses II Pirameses Merimen, short for Pirames. Now remember this name, Pirameses. And then Ramsey said, you know what, I don't think that's good enough. I think we need more cities. And so he ordered a second city built. And this city he dedicated to the patron god of the Ramses family, which was the god Atum. And so he called the city Per Atum. Okay, so we have Piramese and we have Per Atum. Now look what the Bible is saying. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. There you have it. Here again is that confluence of the historical record and what the Bible is telling us. So far, I do believe that this is historically correct, that Ramses II built these two cities, that he enslaved the peasantry of Goshen to build it because most of his labor was serving under arms, and that these are the very two cities that the book of Exodus is referring to. I was in uh, the Delta just May of this year. Manfred Bietak, who is an Austrian archaeologist who's very well known for his excavations there, was excavating just 50 yards to the left. He was excavating a Hyksos palace, which is probably the largest palace ever excavated. And we went out there and he confirmed that